Okay, thank you for joining us today for the One Cape Virtual Learning Series. Today's discussion and Q&A is disagreement and decision, how councils move forward. Today, we're not settling any burning question or hot topic, but we're talking about the process of how councils review research, citizen input, and ultimately make decisions that impact all of us, even when we don't all agree. Um, with us today, we have Ward 3 Representative Councilman Nate Thomas. We have former Ward 1 Representative John Voss, and also our new Finance Director and Dear Issue Team Lead, Dustin Zebel. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Um, for those of you uh, watching online on Zoom or on Facebook, feel free to drop questions in the comments or in the Zoom chat Q&A. And remember, we're not making any policy decisions right now. We're talking about the process for how we go about doing so. So let's get to it with our panelists. First off, what are some examples of issues that weren't just routine, uh, maybe caught a lot of attention where folks didn't agree? What are some examples of that? Can we start with uh, Councilman Nate Thomas? Thank you, um, Nicolette, and I'm glad to be here with the esteemed uh, counterparts that I have here with me, John and Dustin. Um, I guess to start off, we have, you know, the mayor and Gail Conrad, um, our city clerk did a good job last session demystifying how the government worked or how our local government works, but, and we have processes in place. And if you attend our city council meetings, you may see, it may, it may seem pretty monotonous or mundane, if you will, um, addressing the same permitting issues or, or purchases or, or just uh, policies and not really controversial. Well, there are certain hot button issues uh, that do come about. And then, so that's what we're gonna focus on here is how do we really address those as a council? Because contrary to what some may believe, we don't all think the same or agree on all, on all the issues. And for the best of the community in the city of Cape Girardeau, how do we come to uh, a, an agreed upon solution um, or ordinance or resolution uh, to address whatever issue is at hand? Um, I, in my, uh, coming up on year and a half that I've been on the city council, I feel like, uh, I don't know if it's a sign of the times, but I feel like it's been one hot button issue after another. Um, I jumped right in with uh, a tax initiative, a parks and recreation and stormwater uh, tax initiative that had been approved by the voters, a ballot initiative um, for an aquatic center, but then it was to be decided where that aquatic center was going to be located. So I jumped right into that and had to drink from the fire hose and get caught up to speed as much as I could on the background information um, going forward. Other issues, you know, since I've been on board, you know, just a transportation trust fund tax initiative, normally have a, you have a committee, a commission that then sets forth, you know, whatever uh, priorities are gonna be funded by that tax initiative. Uh, for the first time in the history of the five iterations of this initiative, they, the committee couldn't come to a final conclusion that came with options that the city would, the city council then had to finally determine um, you know, then, you know, this year has been unlike any other, and there's been uh, social unrest, there's been uh, issues with the Confederate monument here in town, um, other boards and advisory boards, uh, there was a cyber attack at the beginning of the year, it's an ongoing issue as far as budget and how we allocate our funds and our money and our taxpayer dollars within the city of Cape, um, and then how do you do that in a COVID environment, and so any of those, everybody comes to the table uh, city council um, with their own biases and background and information, uh, and then how do we come to a resolution of how we move forward uh, is is really, you know, in, in listening to our voters the whole way and our constituents to represent what they truly feel is the best direction for the city too. So I know John has also some specific examples. Yeah. Um... Thanks, Nate and, and Nicolette, and to the community for allowing me to participate in this. Um, you know, I, th I think a healthy uh, society is one that can um, respectfully deliberate their differences. Um, and that requires, as Nate said, a healthy dose of being able to listen. You know, we typically have two ears and one mouth, and we should use it in that proportion. And uh, I certainly know when I was on the city council, um, you know, I took very seriously listening to lots of different perspectives uh, before trying to come to a conclusion or a decision. And I think the number one step that an effective um, a policymaker needs to do is set their own personal biases aside because you're in a role to represent and you have to be effective at representing 
all voices, not just your own or those that think just like you. And so being a good active listener and going out and actively seeking differing points of view and really listening and actively listening is to me just a platform to start from. Um, there's a couple of other things that I think are really important um, when you get into um, any discussion, but certainly ones that have the potential for a lot of high emotions. And that is be very clear about what the problem statement is and then what is the desired outcome that we can all align to? What, what are we trying to work towards? And your path to get there may be a little different, but if you take the time on the front end to really clarify what is the problem, write it down and understand what outcome are we looking for? What could be a compromise outcome or something everyone could live with is a great starting point to getting on the right track. Uh, you need to understand who the stakeholders are in the situation and uh, what could be some unintended consequences from a decision that you may make? Because I will guarantee you, not everyone will always agree with every decision that's made as a policymaker. Um, but if you can rationalize out why you're making the decision, the amount of people you talk to, uh, what their points of view were, and how you're acknowledging those or trying to um, address those particular concerns, I think that goes a long way in people accepting we're not all going to agree, but we have to move forward together and, and um, you know, to come together as a community and, and, and just move forward. Dustin, did you want to share any of the issues you had dealt with in uh, previous councils? Now you're new to the city of Cape Girardeau for those of us or those uh, listening online might not realize that. Um, so welcome, of course. And are there any issues that you'd like to share that you've dealt with in the past? Um, nothing in particular, but I, I'm going to echo what John just said. And, you know, things I've used in my past was listen twice as much as I talk. Um, you'd be amazed at how many good pieces of information you can get from opposing sides on an issue. Um, there's pieces of common ground. And even in very divisive topics, there's always a piece of common ground that you can start the discussion with. And and when you find those pieces of common ground and you start the discussion there, it de-escalates the topic a lot more and you can move on to find that good middle ground. Um, but it starts with listening first. Absolutely. So when it comes to these issues where all those um, kind of uh, traits and abilities are so important, things like deer, smoking, masking, taxes, all of these things where people feel so differently, how do they get to the council level? Councilman Thomas, you mentioned earlier about a lot of the tax initiatives, and, and those are largely uh, staff and community driven. But can you speak to how some other issues get to the council level for public deliberation? Yeah, we, you know, we are members of the community um, and we are elected by our wards. There are six council members and then the, the mayor. And um, we have our contact information up on the city's website and uh, individuals reach out, um, whether that's just an individual citizen or taxpayer, or whether that's an individual business or an individual neighborhood uh, or uh, some sort of uh, group could come forward with an idea or an issue or a concern. They can come specifically to their, elect their, um, their elected council member or to the council at large. Um, one of the, uh, the privileges or the, the rights that a citizen has is the ability to come to our city council meetings and let and air their or voice their concerns or their issues or ideas. And we're there to listen to them. Now I will um, caution, you know, some people come uh, with their with that idea at hand and uh, expect an immediate response. And largely, by and large, you will not get that right away. I always look at our job as a council there is to listen and we're not going to make that knee-jerk initial response or action then, we will do our due, dil due diligence and um, find all sides of that issue as John was hitting on. Um, it's our job to look at all sides objectively um, and determine what the, and then as a council come together uh, to determine what uh, the best direction is. You know, a lot of people think that um, because they do come to the council meetings that, and it is somewhat mundane that all the, all the meat goes on behind the scenes. And that's really not. By the state of Missouri, all deliberation happens in front of everybody. Uh, we cannot have meetings as a council outside of what has been publicly posted and invited to the public and to the media, um, such as our council meetings. Um, that is by the sunshine 
time law, that's what we're constrained to. Uh, we do have closed session meetings, but that's for certain specific examples of legislate or policy making that we have to do, whether it's personnel issues on city staff, certain legal uh, or real estate type issues that we can't um, be hashing out in the public eye necessarily up front. Um, and then that's set by the state statute. But everything else is is all uh, negotiated. Uh, we may have one-on-one -on -one conversations with our colleagues on the on the council, but we don't know how the whole council is going to sit on an issue until it comes forward in front of us at a city council meeting. So really to answer your question, from individual citizens, from individual dialogue with us, or when they come in front of the entire council and staff at the city council meetings, that's how it's generated. Yeah, just to piggyback on what Nate said there, um, you know, I was on the council and uh, brought forward a citizen's concerns around the amount of deer in the community. And uh, she came to me as her representative and said, I feel like this is a problem. Could you help me get something done about this? And I brought that forward um, to the council in an open session and said, I've been contacted and, and I'd like to open this conversation, which ultimately led to voters uh, deciding the issue. And I believe it's, it's gonna be brought back up again at our February 1st meeting, again, based on another citizen's request to revisit this topic. Um, so, it, you know, I think it's really important for their, uh, folks watching here today, to, don't be afraid to reach out to a member of the council or to a member of the staff that you may know, and they'll be more than happy to get you to a place where you can have your concern listened to and uh, discussed. Um, you know, we're all just regular folks happen to take a little risk and put our name on a ballot, but we all want to see our community and our neighboring communities grow and prosper in, um, we can get there, but we'll have to work together collaboratively. And I'll, I'll piggyback a little bit off of both of them. Um, the, the statement council member Thomas made regarding immediate response, um, that doesn't happen. There, there are certain rules and laws we have to follow with getting items on the agenda. Um, but the deer issue is a prime example that we had a couple individuals voice opposing views of the same issue um, at the same meeting. And, and the mayor was able to take those comments and request city manager Meyer to do some more research on the topic and, and come back before the council with more information and a recommendation on the issue, um, which like was discussed, that'll be happening on February 1st. I believe that meeting was in October or November um, when that happened. So we're now two or three months down the road before we were able to get enough research and, and get all the data together that the council needs to make an informed decision because there are a lot of sides to the story and a lot of pieces of information that you have to look at when you're looking at these, especially the controversial topics. Um, so the immediate response doesn't happen, but we, we take the time and, and do our due diligence to make sure from a staff perspective is what I'm speaking from, that we get as much data as we can and as good of a recommendation as we can in front of the council so they can make an informed decision. And, and Dustin, while we have you on that, and I, I think you, uh, a couple of you have already touched on it, could you repeat again for folks interested in that deer discussion, where we are at in that process and what that next phase of engagement looks like? So as it sits now um, during study, well, it'll be coming out in the next agenda. We will be discussing the topic in study session on the 1st of February um, with a recommendation and first reading of an ordinance to handle the situation based on the recommendation. So whatever recommendation that you all put forward won't go into effect right away. As you mentioned, there's that first reading, which is part of that uh, kind of routine business of bringing things for, for a first reading, coming back potentially for a second and third reading before anything's put into practice. So how, how does somebody, if they uh, feel strongly about the recommendation, how do they engage with it? What's their, what does that timeline look like? Not about two two weeks to to meet with staff or or council their council representation on that issue. Correct. So the first reading would happen on February first. Um, second and third reading wouldn't happen until February fifteenth. 
So is there is that period of time with which they can reach out to their council members, um, reach out to the administration and things like that. Great, thank you. Um, John Voss, and you I'm, mentioned, oh, I'm sorry. Councilman Thomas, sorry. Oh, that's all right. I was just gonna go back to the original question. You know, some, some issues are uh, pretty, in the grand scheme of things, pretty minor. And, and that's what we're there for. We can we have a whole council inquiry system on our website that we get people to reach out and say, we have too many potholes in the street that I live on. And that's something that we then carry forward to city staff and then that can be rectified from that. And then some, much like the deer issue that we're, we've discussed is it, it rises to the level where there may need to be an ordinance change. And an ordinance is our city laws for the lack of a better word and actually written codified into our laws. Um, or some issues are handled on a more regulatory basis. And all that is outlined in, in our charter as to, to what level certain changes need to be made in order to carry forward any initiatives. Um, and I just wanted to hit on that. Yes, yeah, definitely an important distinction. And anybody that wants to, to look at any of our agendas or documentation or and contact their council can always go to cityofcape.org slash council. Uh, for more of that information on the process and um, current uh, current events. Um, I was going to switch over to John Voss. Um, you had mentioned earlier some uh, some of the traits and things that uh, we should look for in council members when they do deliver, uh, deliberate on these public issues. Is there any other advice or guidance recommendations you'd add for uh, maybe future councils? Anybody that's thinking of running for council members on how to handle um, those tough issues when not everyone agrees? Yeah, um, I guess in my experience, it's, it maybe feel a little different for uh, Councilman Thomas in his uh, year and a half here. But in my experience, in the eight years I was on council, controversial issues are not the majority of what you deal with, right? And so, again, these may be a little bit different times these last 18 months. But um, there certainly were some lightning rod issues, but the vast majority of them are very routine. Uh, they're not contentious. Um, but still warrant your full attention and your full capacity. And um, I found my time on the council to be extremely fulfilling. Uh, you know, I love this community and uh, wanted to try and make it better. And I learned more than I think I was able to provide back in leadership um, or any technical expertise in my eight years on the council. I certainly expanded my, uh, my network of uh, friends and, and uh, acquaintances and uh, would strongly encourage people to get involved and participate in your local government, whether that's running for an office uh, for the city council, or perhaps even just trying to join an advisory board or commission. Um, the council relies heavily on those advisory boards to study detailed issues and to make a recommendation. Um, usually those council uh, members don't have all the same expertise as the members on the advisory board or council and so uh, our commission. And so it's super important that we have qualified individuals filling those to be a great uh, resource um, to the council to make the best decision for the community at that point in time. Um, please overcome your fear, go get involved. Uh, the most important thing that we can do is remain vibrant as a community. And if everyone's involved, we'll be in a much better place than if only a handful of people are trying to do the heavy lifting. Yeah, I'd, go ahead, Nicolette. Were you going to say something? No, sir. Go, go ahead. Oh, I, I agree completely. Um, it, it is extremely fulfilling. Um, but uh, you have to, as they said before, you have to go in with a listening ear. You're there to represent, not to demand. Um, and so uh, listening to your constituents and then you have to go in with an analytical mindset to really then process everything that you've heard. Everyone as a taxpayer is entitled to their opinion or their ideas on any issue. Um, and your job is to listen to them. And it should be as a council member. Um, you know, you will, then it's, you know, in cer certain, hot but certain hot button issues since I've been on, I've then had to then dive down even further and realize some of the emails or voicemails or anything that I've gotten aren't even actually from city of Cape representative. So that's who I'm here to represent. And that's who I want to. Yes, I'm elected by my ward. But, you know, on day one, after you're elected, and they're orienting you, they say, now you're, you're here to represent the good of all Cape Girardeau, not um, 
the good of your ward at the detriment of the other wards. And so it's to represent for the good of the whole city. And um, it, deciphering out that noise to what is the true needs of your city, whether it's a vocal minority, vocal majority or non-vocal minority, or really, you know, a good council member looks down at who is truly affected by the ordinances. I mean, you take something as moving a boundary of a plat 10 feet, you know, everybody in the city may have an opinion on that, but really it comes down to who's directly affected by that. Those property owners, the, that na the neighbors in that area, um, the utilities uh, providers, et cetera. It's nailing down who is truly affected by all of the ordinances that you are looking to enact and, and listening to those people um, as well as the, the opinions everybody has, so. Well, Councilman, I think that was a great segue to the uh, question part of the Q&A. Um, listening to the people, we did get a few submitted questions and I'm just stalling here a second so we can remind um, folks that are live, they can join us by video in the Zoom or if they just wanna drop their questions in the Q&A or chat here on Zoom or live on Facebook in the comments. Um, we did get one uh, from a Mr. Justin who um, had a question or a statement about masking, um, urging us uh, to enforce or drop it. And I think we all recognize um, here on the staff and council level um, that that's actually a county uh, issue. Uh, Councilman Thomas, would you like to make a comment about that? Yeah, and that kind of falls along. And I know we're going to have a separate section uh, or a separate one of these sessions on um the levels of government and uh, that actually uh, we yield because we do not have a health officer on staff um, or a health official elected or on staff, we yield to those health officials that are elected and govern at the county level and set those ordinances. So they, we do not have that health expertise on staff or the public health expertise. So we yield to theirs and that's the policies that they've set forward. Um, you have anything to add? Anybody else? And just as a reminder, we always just follow the, the best guidance we can get from our health officials. Please wear your mask, social, social distance, hygiene, and consider vaccination if that fits with your family's needs. Um, the other submitted question we got is what should folks expect next? What's coming down the pike or what issues as a council member, staff member, former council member, would you like the city to tackle? So I'm gonna stall for another second with this question to allow our panelists to gather their thoughts and whoever unmutes first might win. What should we expect from the council next or what would you like the council to tackle sometime soon? Councilman Thomas, you're unmuted and you look alert. So we'll fling that question to you. I was wondering if that was a, yeah, I, I was unmuted the whole time. So that was a little unfair there, I think. But <laughs> no, I um. Obviously, the biggest issue, which we've already hit on, is you know we we got through COVID, got through some of the social unrest issues, um, not got through them, but um, some of the you know with the Confederate monument and some of those other hot button issues, and then it rolled right into we had the citizens bring forward that ongoing concern of the deer population within the city limits, and then thanks to Dustin and the Department of Conservation and all the great work that they're doing um, and have done to bring forward different ideas and proposals as to how we could um, address this issue. Uh, and so um, that is obviously the most hot button right out of the gate. Um, and that's, you know, beginning in February, our first in person, back in person meeting of council, we're going to be addressing that. But I think some of the other um, ongoing issues will be around uh, the vibrancy of the economy within our um, city. Uh, given the effects of COVID and the ongoing effects of COVID um, and some of the regulations put in place because of COVID to counteract the spread of, of the virus, um, compound that with what is already a dwindling, um, not dwindling, but a, a sales tax that uh, needs to be addressed from a standpoint of lack of ability to collect internet sales tax. And so our bricks and mortar sales tax within the city, which is how we fund all of our city initiatives and um, within our general fund and our budget, um, we have to figure out some way to, to come up to speed and come up to the times. Um, if it's not, you know, hopefully it's enacted at the state level, uh, but how we can be innovative with our budget moving forward, so. 
Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Mr. Voss, did you have some comments? I, I do. So, um, uh, Councilman Thomas hit on a couple of those. And I think it's important to understand what are important issues and what are urgent issues. And so we have an urgent issue with this pandemic that our city leaders need to be squared up to and make sure they go in with their eyes wide open. So how do we protect the safety of our citizens and visitors to our community um, and do that in a way that also is cognizant of we could be seeing a decline in revenues. Um, and there's pressure on costs every day and a, and a citizens um, see that, but what choices are um, Nate and Dustin and other people gonna be faced with in terms of if we see declining revenue, and then because of the pandemic, as, as Nate talked about, um, you know, we currently don't have the Wayfair tax in the state of Missouri, so we're unable to collect sales tax on internet purchases. There's a use tax, uh, which I know um, the county has, but the city Cape does not have that. And so um, I fully expect that our shopping habits are going to be forever altered because of the pandemic, but I'm not sure how or to what extent. And so being aware of how we fund our city operations how can we be the most productive with the resources that have been entrusted to us, but also with an eye towards things are constantly evolving and constantly changing. And so um, we all want as much as we can get from a service, but we all want our taxes to be low. And sometimes those don't always jive. OK, um, back to the hot button issues. We've already kind of beat the deer issue to death. February 1st, be there for the study session recommendation. But another looming issue that hasn't been in the news recently is the whole aquatic center. We still have not made forward progress on what we're going to do to provide that kind of service to our citizens and to our, our neighboring communities. You know, we had the sales or the, the, the tax that passed about how to fund that. Now we've got into some location discussions and partnership issues, and that's still an open item as far as I can see as a citizen. I'm not trying to, to pick a scab here, but I think we're going to have to have that conversation in the coming year as well. Mr. Z, you ready for me, Nicolette? Yes, sir. Um, so from our perspective, uh, as far as staff and finance goes, um, those issues that, that they discussed are, are issues we're looking at. Um, Prior to me leaving Wyoming and, and coming here to Cape Girardeau, that was one of the big issues we were fighting is we were trying to figure out the effect COVID would have on our revenue numbers, especially our sales tax numbers. And the other issues that we were facing. So um, in Wyoming, oil and gas is a major industry. So with oil and gas struggling a little bit through the pandemic, that was a concern through the budget process, along with a census being done, a presidential election. Um, I'm not talking about who you voted for. I'm talking about, in general, a presidential election will affect the economy various ways, um, some we don't even know about. And throughout this process that we're going through this next couple months to establish the Cape Girardeau budget for the upcoming fiscal year, um, those are things we also have to take into consideration still because it's not gone. Um, those things continue to carry forward. And those are things we have to take into consideration. We're setting that budget. Um, like John said, we're trying to maximize the dollar for the citizen and get as much done as we possibly can. But also, you don't want to overtax your citizens either. So it's that delicate balance that you have to fight. Um, and, and reviewing all the external factors that play into this at a state, federal level, um, from the economy standpoint, and all these different factors play in. Um, another thing that is coming through the pipeline, uh, I believe on February 15th, um, will be the, I'm sorry, Mar March 1st, I got to look at my calendar, um, but the capital improvement plan. Um, this is a plan we put together um, to show various capital projects we have coming up. Um, we've done some work uh, to renovate that a little bit um, to hopefully make it a little clearer to the citizens what's, what exactly is going on and, and what's in the plan. Um, it's been cleaned up a little bit to hopefully show it a better way that people can see it clearer. Um, so that's another thing. While it's not necessarily a hot button item, it's, it's one of those things that is very important to the city from a financial standpoint of different projects we have coming up that we're planning on in, in the next few fiscal years. 
So that's another thing that's coming forward. I got something else to add, Nicolette, if you don't mind. Um, one of the, now that I have more time to think about it, one of the, you know, it's not necessarily a hot button issue from a, uh, a standpoint of public involvement or input. Um, it drastically affects the public. And in Mayor Fox's session, last session, about the, the mis demystifying current, uh, local government, he talked about how the city manager is essentially the CEO of our city, and we charge them with how to run the city. Um, they are a leadership. They are one of two positions that the council directly hires, the city manager and the municipal judge. And our city manager of 11 plus years is, is retiring, and Scott Meyer. And so we are have just, we're in the middle of um, that recruitment process of applicants for our next city manager. And that is, could be, or is um, one of, if not the most important decisions that our council can make is hiring and setting that up. So every council member comes to it with the lens with which they're looking, an idea of what they want in that next um, city manager. And then we, and an eye with which we analyze all of the applicants. And so that will be one area with which all of our council will have to come together and deliberate and uh, come together to for the best decision of where to move forward and with whom to move forward with in that uh, city manager role, so. Certainly an important uh, next thing to, for the council to tackle. Gentlemen, we're right at about that half hour mark. Did you have any other final um, comments or statements you'd like to make before we conclude? Justin? Um, I'll jump in. Um, one thing I, I just wanna make sure everybody knows, um, in, in my years of experience within municipal government, and I believe council member Thomas and, and Mr. Voss can attribute a similar response to this. There is probably not a single item voted on by a council that if you put it to the public would ever have unanimous, unanimous support 100%. It is almost impossible to find that topic. And I've never seen it and I'm sure they haven't either. Um, one thing I would request is let your voice, voice be heard like council member Thomas said, um, if you have input, get a hold of somebody. But on the same note, keep it civil. Um, civility is one of the, the guiding factors here. Um, your voice can be heard in a civil manner and it can be considered um, throughout the process. Again, we want all the facts out there so the city council can make a great decision to the best of their ability. Without that information, they can't do that. But on the same note, even if your thoughts on the topic aren't approved in that manner, but please stay civil. Um, I think everybody within staff, the administration, the council, um, and the citizens all in the end want the same thing, and that's what's best for the city of Cape Girardeau. Um, and that's the thing we gotta always come back to is, even though we have differences, we all have the same goal. So that's my two cents on that. That's great, thank you. Anyone else? Outstanding. Well, thank you very much to our viewers who, who were with us today and uh, don't let the conversation end here. If you do have any questions or comments, you can always visit our website, cityofcape.org slash contact or cityofcape.org slash council. Um, you can call us 339-6320 or contact us right here on Facebook if that's where you're watching. We're happy to answer your questions and get you in contact with your officials. The uh, next, uh, please join us for the next One Cape Virtual Series event. Um, we schedule them on Mondays opposite council meetings. The next one's February 8th at 1 p.m. We're going to talk about streets and infrastructure with Councilwoman Stacy Kinder and our Public Works Director Stan Polovic. You can sign up online at cdcape.org slash One Cape Series. And that's all we have. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much.